Um, a few years later, we get Castle in the Sky, um, which does not have a lot of animals in it, but it does have fox squirrels, which is a lovely, lovely thing. Um, um, I had been reading a good chunk of Nausicaa before I watched Castle in the Sky, and that came on, and I was like, ah! That's awesome. Um, was that a question? <laughs> okay. Have you noticed that the squirrels are essentially clones of Tetsuo? Pretty much, yes. <laughs> Um, so there are basically no animals in this other than the fox squirrels, but I do think the robot is significant. Because I think the robot represents a connection to this Edenic past on Lapida. Um, Miyazaki being Miyazaki, he thinks through his settings, he thinks through his worlds. Lapida, environmentally, cannot support large animals. There's not enough vegetation, and there's not enough um, animal to support carnivores. So everything has to be, you know, a rodent or a bird or things along these lines, small animals. So when the kids show up on Laputa, if he wanted to show some connection to that, he could not do it through any kind of large animal. So he chose the robot to represent that connection. So it is a sort of um, um, partial connection. It, 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 is, it is a symbol, not through an animal itself, but through the idea that this thing is caring for nature. It is the, the protector of nature, and that's what we're connecting um, with through this idealized past that, um, that we, we no longer have, and, and we, we've lost. And again, we, we see here that this is not just about animals anymore. It's not just, oh, animals are great, animals everywhere. It is, we should have this deep connection to nature. It is lost, it is gone, and we're, you know, there is no easy way to get it back. That is notable that in Castle in the Sky, you basically see no animals until Lapia, right? They're around, obviously, like birds and such. But um, there's this idea that we have this industrialized world, and they're all gone. Um, then we get to Monte Ritotoro. Before we go any further, no, my neighbor to uh, uh, Totoro itself is not the god of death. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for those who don't know, there was this theory that took me online a little while ago that Totoro, that the, the movie is actually this um, sad tragedy where the girls actually die at the end, and Totoro and the cat bus are basically leading them on to the afterlife. Um, this is what we call confirmation bias. Um, somebody noticed the beginnings of this pattern, and when we notice a pattern, what humans do is we, um, we look for data to support that pattern and ignore everything else that does not fit that pattern. If you look at the movie as a whole, you know, that does not fit, right? It is very small bits of that movie made to make that connection. Yes, question? Yeah, not to mention the fact that, um, like, at one point they noticed, hey, the girls don't have their shadows near the end. And yeah. There's references to a real, like, tragedy that happened. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it's like, they're reaching, obviously. But anyway, uh, um, moving on. Um, so. What are the Sith Sprites? The, the first real, uh, you know, creature we see in the movie. Um, as far as I know, these are original to Hayao Miyazaki, and they clearly represent nature reclaiming abandoned spaces, right? We leave, and lichen shows up, and you know, insects, and small animals, and that's basically what the Sith Sprites are. But what's notable about the Sith Sprites is dramatic, um, dramatically speaking. Note the Sith Sprites are entirely passive, non-threatening creatures. They do nothing to cause any harm, and then they leave. From a dramatic perspective, this violates a lot of traditional laws of drama. When <laughs> stories thrive on conflict, right? You have to have conflict to have a story. So these soot sprites show up. Any other writer would say, okay, what problem are the soot sprites causing that the heroes have to solve? Right? You know, are they causing mischief in the house? Are they doing something so that the girls now have to do something to drive them away? Miyazaki says, no. Animals in nature are innocent. They exist. We don't have to drive them away or deal with them. Instead, we figure out how they work and respond appropriately. We realize, okay, all we have to do is live here, and then they'll go away on their own accord. Cool, we're just going to do that. Totoro itself, well, the Totoros, I think very clearly represent um, essentially 
symbols of the girls' new home. Basically, the girls have moved into this new environment. They're clearly not from a rural environment. They're learning how all of this works. And that, is, that can be a little overwhelming, right? But being young children, they're not scared of this. Right? It's not frightening, this new environment. But it is new. And so what is Totoro? This fuzzy, non-threatening thing, but it still doesn't look like anything traditional. It's like a panda. It's basically a panda. But you know, that, that is the idea, is that they're basically um, symbols of these girls getting used to this new environment. It should also be noted that Satsuki does not resolve the movie. Satsuki is not the hero of this film in that sense. Satsuki goes to Totoro. She does not even technically ask Totoro for help. She says, my sister's lost and I'm scared. Please help somehow. And Totoro said, and then Totoro says, um, <laughs> doesn't talk too much. Um, Totoro summons the cat bus. The cat bus finds Meg. And then the cat bus takes them to see their mother, which resolves the fundamental underlying conflict um, intention of the third act. Technically, the animals are the hero of My Neighbor Totoro. <laughs> right? Because animals are awesome and humans are, suck. Um, you know? Uh, but th that is kind of the, the what Miyazaki is kind of getting across here, is that if we respect nature, if we handle it properly, nature will help us. Right? Um, although Totoro does have the scariest movie in all of Miyazaki's films, that frickin' goat. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just be honest about it. But it's, it's a good. Um, it's also, it is a side note, what I love about the scene is that we see the goat from two perspectives. It shows up, we see it from the back, it's totally non-threatening. We see it from May's perspective, and it's suddenly horrifying. And we know, oh, it's just a goat, right? But from this young child's perspective, it's this really you know, overwhelming thing. Yeah, that's true. All right. Moving on to Kiki. Um, not a lot, I mean, some animals in Kiki, but whatever. And nobody ever seems to notice this. Kiki's is based on a book. It, it is a children's book, a Japanese children's book that Miyazaki adapted. Um, it is now out of print in English. It is being re-released in July with a new translation. If you want a copy of that, it's short. Um, it's available for pre-order on Amazon if you want to go grab that. And with a new cover, nicely. Um, so, I want to talk about three different animals in Kiki's delivery service. And the first is that dog. You notice in that house with dog lips, the young boy is shown to be um, a little distracted, like he doesn't really do what his parents do immediately. He's not very obedient. He's fine, but you know, the parents are all kind of distracted, not really paying attention to the kid. The dog is the only like unqualified positive character in that house. Miyazaki goes out of his way to show that the humans have flaws, but not the dog, basically, right? And then there are the crows. The crows are unquestionably presented as antagonists early on, but Miyazaki does not allow us to see it that way. We later see the crows as Ursula's kind of muse. Like, they're very important to Ursula, and it's how she gets a lot of her drawing and her practice done. So Miyazaki, you know, even changes that around. And then, of course, there's Gigi. Um, Besides being a remarkably marketable sidekick character, um, Gigi is Kiki's connection to her powers. And even further, when Kiki's depressed, when Kiki's kind of feeling that weirdness, it is when she loses her connection to Gigi that she realizes she's lost her powers. It is her connection to her animal companion that is what makes her who she is. Much like Teto and Nausicaa, when Kiki loses her connection to animals. She is no longer who she feels that she is. She's lost what makes her special. Right. Um, so we see here very clearly, animals really important. Yes. Not to mention the fact that um, the original Japanese notes and the English notes actually have two different messages that are both equally important. Like mm. in the Japanese, she doesn't regain even after she regains her ability to fly and whatnot. Gigi never talks again, so it's like, okay, you're growing up, you don't have to rely on that sort of thing as much now that you're growing up, well, as in the English dub, Gigi does in fact regain the ability to speak when she regains that connection. Although, and this is something that I only noticed recently, Gigi never talks to Kiki. 
at the end. Gigi says, Kiki, 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 runs up. But you never see them interact in that ending. Oh, no. Yeah. That's interesting. And I, I'm not, sh I, I think that was basically Disney saying, hey, we have, you know, we want to show that Gigi is no longer an animal. Right? Gigi has not just reverted to animal state, but we want, but we, we still don't want to, you know, change that ending. So they kind of added that line to say, Gigi's still Gigi, but you don't know if Kiki and, and Gigi have still had the connection. Well, who knows? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, by the way, Disney like worked really closely with Ghibli on those dubs. So even when we're like, why did they do that? Like, you know, Miyazaki checked off on every single one of those changes, right? So there's clearly something going on there. Anyway, 